Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Marvin, for that. What's going on? I am on, guys. Can you hear me out there, guys? There we go. All right. Thank you, brother. Amen. I was watching one of the, I think it was, yeah, it must have been last week's service. Um, he was playing a special, and they have them online. We have them on uh, YouTube video playing because we got camera set up and stuff up there, playing with his feet and his hands and stuff. That takes too much coordination for me. <laughs> Amen. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. I want to jump in here today and I really do pray that we have a great year. I pray you do as well and looking forward to what this next year has. Um, last year was kind of crazy as well. It seems like the last few years um, have been pretty crazy. So I'm looking to, I'd like, to, what I'd like to see this year is normalcy. Wouldn't that be nice? Normal, kind of even a dull year in some aspects. <laughs> There's no crazy bad things happening. Um, but Amen. Praise God. Let's serve the Lord. Hebrews 13, I'm going to jump in. I don't want to keep you too long, but I do want to give you what the Lord has given me. It's funny, it doesn't usually happen this way, but I got this message over a week ago, I think it was. Um, so usually if I get something kind of put together in that far away, it gets changed. But God kept it this way, so I'm, I'm happy. Hebrews 13, look at verse number 5 with me. Hebrews 13, verse number 5, it says, Let your conversation... Be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we open your word, and Lord, we come before you here today and in your presence, and Lord, we come with open hearts and minds and to learn, to grow, and Lord, I want to thank you for this last year. Thank you that we're here today and the start of the new year in your house, Lord, worshiping you and fellowshipping with the brethren. And I do ask that you use me as your servant to preach this message, help us all to receive it, apply it to our lives, that we can be better witnesses and children for you. And, and I ask, Lord that, Lord, that we can make a good start to this year, that Lord, if there needs to be some changes in our life that's good, that we'll make those changes and make them permanent, that we'll get rid of some of the old things or any faults or weaknesses or sins that were in our life, and Lord, let that be in the past. Help us, Lord, to really make this next year, Lord, our future glorifying to you. Father, please just use this message for your glory. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we look at this scripture, the Bible says in verse 5, let your conversation, which is another word as well for behavior, um, be without covetousness. Now, we just got finished through Christmas, and you know, one of the biggest things in Christmas, um, unfortunately, is um, a lot of gifts that are given, and gifts aren't bad, um, but there tends to be a lot of covetousness, a lot of things of what people want and kids want and everything like that, you know, and um, if we get too caught up in it, the world makes a lot of money on people's covetousness. Amen? That's just a fact of life. It's not just during Christmas, it's all throughout the year. Um, but he says in here, let our behavior be without covetousness. And it's just a command given to us to help us understand how we're supposed to be behave in this world, how we're supposed to act, the way we're supposed to think. And then it says, and be content with such things that ye have. Now, I've preached on covetousness a number of times over the years. Um, I'm sure if you've been in, in church for a while, you've heard messages on covetousness and um, how we as God's children, as Christians, should not be covetous, you know, which is shouldn't covet things, you know, that's part of the Ten Commandments as well. And there's a lot of wisdom to that. There's a lot of understanding. But I do think sometimes people don't take time to really think the gravity of everything involved in that and what that means. And I'm hoping to help you with some of that here this morning because in verse 5 he says, Be content with such things that you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So he brings this last statement into the scripture talking about covetousness and he's talking about our behavior. You know, don't let, you know, don't let ourselves behave like we're coveting things. And he says, for he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Now, why would we have that statement right after those, that first statement? You know, we're talking about covetousness. What does it have to do with God leaving us or forsaking us? Well, I think there's a lot to say that. And if you look at verse 6, it kind of gives us that explanation. It says, so that we may 
boldly say, so with confidence say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So verse number six kind of explains what verse number five is about. Covetousness is you have a desire, there's a heart where you want something that you don't have. And so he says we shouldn't be wanting things that we don't have. You know, now, of course, like anything, there's a balance to some of that. You know, if you have good things that you are supposed to have because you're not acquiring them, then it's okay to want those things. You know, like if you want to be more gracious and more kind and you're not, well, it's good to want that. You know, just basic things. But what we're saying here, he's saying, listen, we need to be content with what we have in this life. God's never going to leave us or forsake us. What's the point to that? He's my helper. So if I'm coveting things that I don't have, that means I'm not content, I'm not happy, I'm not satisfied with what I have right now. And I'm supposed to be satisfied with God in him alone. See, the problem we see, and I think we see it a lot more in the, in the developed world, is people we can get into a mindset of what we think we have to have as almost as a need to function or be happy in the world we live in. And all of us feel that way. Um, How many people have a vehicle right now, a car? How many people have had that car break down where you could not drive it? Okay. How frustrating is that? Did you feel like you need that car? Right? What happens is you got programmed to believe that you necessarily, you have to have that vehicle. But how'd you do without it? Did you make it? You did. See, in our established world, there's a lot of things that are needed. You know, I would think I need a car. I'll be honest with you. My car goes down, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be doing everything I can to get that car going. I'm not denying that. And in some aspects, I think there is a need for that in my, my mindset of needing it. I live quite a ways away from the church, so I would need something to do my job, to come back and forth to do my job, to take my kids somewhere, or, you know, go shopping for the kid. Well, Shannon can do, does a lot of that. But I mean, I would need things to be able to fulfill my life at the level that I'm used to doing. But if I didn't have one, say the world, you know, electrical grid crashed and, you know, the, all of a sudden you couldn't pump gas and all of a sudden the vehicles, you couldn't really drive them much anymore, would I still be able to function in life? Of course. It would be much different probably be more difficult by the, for the most part, but you'd find ways to get around that. You know, whether it's carpool, whether it's taking buses or whatever it may be, you'd find ways to get around. You'd have to move sometimes maybe if you have to. I don't know. You know, get back to horse, horseback. Start bumming rides from the Amish or something like that. <laughs> but um, you'd find ways to adjust. So needs can change and become things that we don't really necessarily need, the more wants of convenience, not necessarily needs. But we get programmed to think of things that we need, you know? Um, We think, hey, I need a house. I need a place to lay my head. Well, I started thinking about a lot of these needs that we think we have, even things that we think that I think are necessity, you know, or pretty close to it. And I started thinking about my life and the lives of people around me and people that I know. How life can change so quick in an instant. You know, you can be happy one day and the next hour you're not. You're broken. You know, things change in life. And the life that we live down here is very fluid. It changes so much. Why is New Year's resolution so popular? Because people want to make changes in the right direction. Always trying to better themselves. We want to better our life. We want to better our standing in this life that we have. And that's that's not wrong. It's not bad to want inside something better 
You know, I want a better relationship with God. Is that wrong? Of course not. So there are things that are of wants that are okay, but there's a lot of wants that we have that are not okay or that are not necessarily to even try and make too much effort, effort in ourselves to want those things. You know, I started thinking about certain things in life. Like um, five years ago, I've been living in, in New York now since... 1995, I think we moved here. So we've been here quite a while now. Moved back. I should move back here. I was out in California in the Marine Corps, and then we moved back here and stuff, started the church. And I've hated winter. Hate winter. I loved San Diego weather. Sunny and warm all the time. It was great. Never had gloomy days, and if you did, it was only a few times here and there, no big deal. They'd, it'd burn off in the morning and be nice and sunny, and, you know, I loved those days. I loved it. Moved out here, it's gloomy most of the day of the year. <laughs> so you kind of, it was, you know, winter and cold and the wind and the work, you know, all the extra work, the shoveling and snow blowing, all that stuff. I did not like it. But something changed last year. Got a snowmobile. And that's Jim's help, you know. He helped me get that snowmobile. and It made my life in winter a little better. Started even enjoying some of that. So for how many years, I hated winter. Now I, I don't dislike it. I'd still love to have warm and sunny all the time, and I, if that was my preference. But now I manage. I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm actually bummed our snow's melting. I'm like, what's going on with the snow? I get a snowmobile, and now I can't ride. You know, I'm frustrated. You know, but things change. But how many people in here have had to work outside in the snow? in the cold. Anybody like that? number of you. See, when you have to work outside in it, not playing in it, not going from your house to your car, I'm talking about being outside and working in it, it's a different world now. Now it's like, I really don't like winter much at all anymore, right? But you know what I found this, and I, this just happened to me, I don't know, just maybe a month ago when we started getting the cold and the, and the snow. I was watching this, um, um, show on Alaska and they're talking about life in Alaska and people and, and they were showing them outside working and they're in the snow and blowing and they're putting up fence and they're doing fixing things and everything and I'm watching these guys and I'm going man, I, I don't, would not want to live in Alaska you know and I'm, I'm appreciating that but something started changing in my mind while watching that show I ended up that next morning I left and I went outside and I did some things outside in the cold and in the snow and it didn't bother me as much because I was thinking about these people that are out there living and working in it all the time. Well, if they can do it, certainly I can do it. And I actually started even enjoying working in it. Now, I know that sounds kind of you know, crazy, senile kind of thing, but you know what's different? Nothing changed but the way I looked at it. Nothing changed at all except for what I perceived, how I was thinking about working or being out in that cold. You guys understand that point? See, if I wouldn't have watched that show and thought about the people working out and living in it and all that stuff, and I would have went out the next morning and had to work outside, I would have been not liking it. But I was like, oh, it's no big deal. It's how you dress. It's how you look at it. And just started working, doing stuff, you know. And, and I've worked outside a lot in my life for most of my life in all kinds of weather. But that day didn't bother me that much. All because of how I looked at it. How I perceived it. You know, I want you to think about something here today. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 with me. And I want you to think a little bit with me about life in general. Just life in general. Here in 1 Timothy 6, in verse number 6, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So I want you to think about that for a moment. This is a command of Paul to Timothy, and he's talking about him, and he says, listen, godliness with contentment is great gain. So if you have God and you're living a godly life, 
and you're content with just God, you have great gain. Just like we talked about just in the last scriptures. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Well, what does that have to do with being covetous? Because if you are content with God, you don't need anything else. And then he kind of simplifies a few things and he says food and raiment. If we have those two things, we, need, we should be content. And let's face it, I know what that's like. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like not to be without clothing. I mean, I've always had raiment. But there's been some times in our life where I didn't really have much food or we ate our last meal and didn't know where the next food was going to come from. I've been there myself. I've been there as an adult with me and my wife um, and I've been there as a kid with my parents in my life. And so I've seen those days. And when you don't have food, it's hard to think of much else. How many people have fasted in here before? And when you go past where you're not eating, everything sounds good right even things you hate you go a few days they start sounding like I could really eat that okra right you just start thinking everything smells good I remember I was on a fast a prolonged fast I think it was around six my sixth day or something and our church out in California was having a chili cook-off for the men and I had to bring chili and I remember sitting there, with Shannon's helping me, we're at the kitchen, we're cooking. I'm smelling, I'm feeling guilty that I'm breaking my fast because it smelled so good. It almost made me feel like I'm cheating on my fast. Just the smell of it. See, when you don't have food, it consumes you. That's why fasting is a very special thing to do. You're, you're denying the flesh. But God said, food and raiment, that's all we need. That's all you need to be content. You don't even need a house to go home to. Go. You don't need toys. You don't need a lot of things in life. You need food and raiment to be content. You know, you don't need a spouse. You don't need a friend on this earth. You don't need those things. You need God. The question is, do you believe that? Do you want to believe it? Or do you believe it? You know, as I was thinking more about this scripture, I was thinking about, what about our life? What if your life is bad or hard? That's probably a better word. What if you have a hard life? What if the life that you're living right now is just difficult, struggling? I ask you this question. I really want you to think about this. Why aren't you content with your life? Because you should be. You know, you can live a happy, joyful life if you're with God, even during a difficult life. You know, I've met people that live difficult lives. I've traveled literally around the world. I've gone to different countries and I've seen some lives that people had that, wow, it's rough. I remember being in the Philippines and we're in the Marine Corps, we're on a gun range and we're shooting all day long. We're, you know, doing all our, you know, training and everything. And at the end of the, end of the day, ceasefire and everything, they put the flags up. All of a sudden, a bunch of kids would run out onto the gun range and they'd start picking up all the brass and all the bullet lead and everything and the steel casings and boxes. They would pick up all this stuff. And I'm like, what are these kids doing? And somebody that was there that's been in the Philippines, they said, <laughs> wait till tomorrow. The next day, they were selling us knives of the stuff that they just picked up that day. I was like, there is no way. And I mean, some of these knives look, I mean, they didn't look cheap. They, if I would have tried to make something like that, it wouldn't even look like it. They looked like a legitimate knife that you'd buy in a store. They'd rust real fast, we found out, but <laughs> they looked really good. And I was like, what? How do they know how to do this? Because that's their life. They found a way to adapt in a life where they didn't really have much else. See, we learn to adapt sometimes when the things are the hardest. We learn to make a living. We're, we're pretty much, every person is very selfish by nature. 
That's why God says, love your neighbor as what? As yourself. God knows our nature, our sinful nature. You know, the more I think about life, and I've been through some tough times in life, not even close to what some people live their everyday lives on, but I've had tough times in my life. But for the most part, I've had a pretty good life. In a lot of aspects, according to most of the people in this world, probably a pretty good life and spoiled life. But you know, some of the people that have had, had so little, I've found to be so happy. I think about some of the toughest times I've had in my life as an adult. Me and my wife, when we first moved out here, our first year here in New York from California was a tough one. Lost my house, I mean, lost my job. I lost my, our, we didn't have any income coming in. Both our vehicles broke down. We were in the middle of winter. Couldn't get a job for anything. I was looking for another job. Couldn't find one at the time. Ate our last meal. Had no more food in the house. I'll tell you what, it was struggling in the, overall aspect. But you know what? I was happy. It was one of the sweetest times we've had. Remember those days? Shannon's going, well, kind of, but we sat around playing games in this little one-room apartment. We just played card games, Monopoly, just having fun, just relaxing. Yeah, in the back of my mind, I'm sure. I mean, I think back there, I think of the good things. I don't think of the bad times that we had, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure there was some kind of stress, but God showed us some great miracles. I've given that many times where somebody sent us some money in the mail, 20 bucks, said, take your wife out to dinner, and that was the start of kind of getting back where God was just saying, I got you. I'm handling it. Everything's good. And God just took care of us, and he watched out for us. It wasn't a good time in successful, what the world thinks, but... Inside, it was something special to me because it showed me God's there. He knows and everything's good. I don't have to worry. don't have to be upset. don't have to stress about it. He'll never leave me or forsake me. You know what? I was content. I can honestly say I was content. Why can't we be like that all the time, though? I believe we can. You know... I look at these scriptures and I think about having food and raiment therewith be content. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, him, God using through the Holy Spirit that word, I think we need to pay attention to. See, when we think of contentment and covetousness, we think covetousness means about gain, increase, getting more. But God says we're not supposed to be covetous. But he says if we have contentment and we have godliness, we're going to gain. So we're going to get more because we have these two things, godliness and contentment. See, I want to challenge you this next year to be content with the life that you're living right now, no matter what you're living. No matter how bad or how hard or how tough your life is, I encourage you and I challenge you to be content with it. What does that look like? What does a content life look like during a hard life? It starts changing your perspective of what your life is. I believe if you become truly content while living a hard, difficult life, it doesn't seem so hard and difficult. See how it kind of contradicts itself? I want you to think about that for a moment. I was, I was thinking about how we can start seeing joy in our life if we're content. We start appreciating other things around us. Everyone in here that's an adult knows what it's like when you start worrying about something. You know how much it consumes your mind? When something's bothering you, you know how much it just consumes your mind? It's constantly there. It's constantly rearing its head. The problem is constantly always overshadowing your thoughts and your behavior and your attitude. It's always there. But when you can be content, if you can be satisfied with that life or that position or that problem or that pain that you're living in, you're able to stop thinking about it every second and you can start looking at some other things around you and how nice other things are and how it really isn't that bad. And you can start appreciating who God is and how wonderful He truly is. Even during that time where it doesn't seem like the world's being fair. 
God is always good. And the more we stop and look at God, the less we see of the problems in this world. You know, I've learned at least as a Christian, as a child of God, that the more I keep my eyes on him, the less I worry about other things in the world, in the problems, in the heart. Because we live in a fallen world. That's, that's a give. This world isn't our home, right? This isn't my home. We're just temporarily going through it until God takes us home someday. But I'm supposed to make the best of it while I'm here. I'm in my work phase right now of my life. My life is eternal right now. When I accepted Christ, my life went from temporary to eternal. And so now I look at life in an eternal view. What's the most I have here on this earth? And to be honest, if I make it to 80, I am super blessed. I really don't think I'm getting there. But I hope to God I can, for the sake of my children, be able to see them grow and not get too broken. But if I make it to 80, I'm in plus, man. Because I am a mess now, so I can't imagine another <laughs> so many years. But even if I made it to 100, what is that for a million? Nothing. It's a drop. But my time right now is important. It's my time to work for God. See, when, my, when I'm done with my earthly living here, I'm done with work. I can't give back to the Lord anything anymore. I can't be obedient to him and show him true love because he takes away some of that willful. We, we're no longer sin anymore. There's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sin, no more darkness, no more death. It's all light and joy and peace. I'm, in, I'm at work right now. We're all at work right now if you're a child of God. And how we view this life, we should appreciate it. I'm thankful for a job. I'm glad I can come to work. I can be a pastor. I can come to work and I can work. I can, and you say, well, is that supposed to be work? It's a calling, but it's still work. It's, it's responsibility. I've been without work. I didn't like it. I like having purpose. But you know what? If I lost this job, if I wasn't a pastor anymore, my life isn't ended. Because I know God's got control. Whatever he's going to have next is whatever. And I can enjoy it. If I lost the things that I have materialistically, yeah, it'd make things probably a little more difficult and challenging. I wouldn't like it as much in the beginning, I'm sure, but hopefully I'm mature enough as a Christian to say, well, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, like Job. Amen? Are we, can, can we be content with our life? We live in a world that's all about covetousness. Every time you turn around, it's about the next best thing and what you don't have and somebody showing off all the things they do have. Who cares what somebody else has? I have the greatest thing, the greatest gift anybody can ever have, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's true, right? You don't need anything else. And as long as I'm breathing, all I need, according to the scripture, is Jesus Christ, God, and food and raiment. That's all I need to live here right now. Right? Everything else is a bonus. So if you have those three things, don't complain. Don't worry. Don't get upset. Don't get aggravated or think that you're a tough life because you can enjoy the life you've got if you can be content. Amen? You know what I hear a lot of times when I talk to somebody personally about this subject? They say, well, it's easier said than done. Well, why don't you try doing it and you'll see how easy it becomes. <laughs> That's my response. Just start living that way. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 13 with me. Hebrews chapter 13. It says in verse number 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And be content with such things as ye have, for he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, we see the same, you say, well, that sounds like the same thing, but he says, be content with such things as ye have. You know, I'm thankful for what I have, and truthfully, I know I have a lot. If I tried comparing it to people, I'd say, wow, I got a lot. If I started comparing it to some other people, I'd say, wow, I don't have anything. 
depends on who you're comparing to. But you know what? When you look at it through God's eyes and everything's a blessing, you can be content with what you have, each one of us, each individual. So well, I, I lost this. Yeah, maybe you did, but you should be happy with what you have. Well, I don't have what that person... It's not about you and that other person. It's about you and God and what you have now. Can I just help you today by saying, if you know that God's by your side and he becomes your most important, precious gift, other things become so less important. It really does. Why don't we look at this new year as, I'm blessed. I'm so thankful to have God in my life. Because, you know, I've gone through some times where, and I'll be very transparent with you this morning. There's been times in my life where I thought about taking my life. I didn't want to live this life anymore. I've been there. I'm so thankful that I didn't and not been so selfish at that point and hard. But things are hard at times in life, and I get it. I feel that. But, you know, when I'm with God, I don't feel that. When I'm drawing close and I'm going through the tough times and I'm looking at him, like the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, it's when you look at him as everything, the start and the end, we can start looking at things as, I'm good today. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what each person is facing today. I really don't. God does. And maybe you're in that trial time. Maybe you're in that difficult time of life where things are not easy. Please let me tell you. Look to God. Trust in him. And I'm telling you, it's going to get easier. I'm not saying it's going to change all the circumstances around you. I'm just saying it's going to change something inside in our heart and in our minds. And he's going to give us that peace that passes all understanding. He's going to give us that thing that's real, that really matters. And that's himself. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. Thank God. What is one of the biggest, greatest names of the Holy Spirit? The Comforter. He's our Comforter. He's there to help us, to comfort us, to get us through the worst of what our life is ever going to be like for eternity. This is the worst but it also can be good. Amen? And I want you to see it that way. This world is our worst if you're a child of God. But it can also be good and enjoyable. The joy that God gives. If you're willing to just trust him. Keep your eyes on him. And live a life of contentment. It's not about what this life can offer me or give me. It's all about what I have. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's live that life. I guarantee you, you'll tend to wake up more with a smile than a frown. Amen? You'll put your head on, it, on, the, on the pillow at night and you'll be, I'm good. I don't know what 2023 is going to be. I know this. I really do know this. It's going to get worse in general. Because the Bible tells us it's going to get worse. But you know what? It could be a lot better for you and I. It really depends on how you're looking at it, your perspective, and keeping God first. Because when you keep your eyes on him, it makes things a lot easier. Amen? Please hear this message. It's helped me, and I know it can help you if you live it. Not just hear it. you got to live it. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for the many promises you've given us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the help, the comforter that you've given us, each one of your children. Thank you, Father, for that. Help us, Lord, not to look at this world, Lord, in a way of want, but, Lord, in a way of love. Lord, in what we can give back. And I know that's a whole separate mindset and even a message. But Lord, we need to look at this world on how much we can give back to others for you. 
and be appreciative and be content with the life that you've given us today. Lord, we know and we should know that this world isn't, isn't our future. It's not the best of what we have to offer. This is just a part in our history, even in, in a lot of ways the worst part, but it doesn't have to be bad. I do pray that you help each person in here today to begin their new year fresh with their eyes on you because you are the constant. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You're always there. You care for us. You love us. You said cast all our care on you because you care for us. And you loved us so much that you gave your life. Help us, Lord, to draw close to you this year, each and every day, to fulfill your purpose for our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's take a few minutes and talk to the Lord. And I think we need to get to a point where we live each and every day with contentment. Maybe wake up in the morning with some reminders on your bedstand, on your mirror in the bathroom, on your refrigerator, in your car, with just a statement of live and be content. Be happy with what we have because God's blessed us with everything we need. Let's learn what peace and joy is all about. Learn to accept the life that we're living. Learn to accept our lot in life. This is your life that you're living. Accept it. Appreciate it. Be content with it. Stop comparing yourself to others and to what you think. Just thank God for it. Let's take a few minutes and talk to the Lord. And if you're in here today and you're not sure of your salvation, I don't want you to begin this new year without the gift of eternal life. The gift that God has given us is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're in here today and nobody looking around, if you can just be honest and say, you know, preacher, I don't know if I died today that if I'd have a home in heaven. You can know that for sure. I promise you, it's so easy. God himself said in his word that it's the simplicity that's in Christ. It is so simple. It's believing you're a sinner. It's believing that your sin is what separated you from God. Not how you brought up, not what you do or haven't done. It's your sin. But the good news is Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. He paid that penalty. The Bible says he died, was buried, but he also rose again to give you and I life. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. A lot of people have heard the name of Jesus, but they never believed. They never received him. Today, if that's you, you need to receive him. Receive that gift. Just as at Christmas, if somebody gave you a gift, all you had to do was reach out and take it. That's what God is doing today to you and I. He's offering us a gift of eternal life, but it only comes through Jesus. you got to be honest with yourself and say, Lord, I'm in need of a Savior. I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed. Please forgive me, and please save my soul. If you say those words to the Lord or something similar where you're just calling out to Him for salvation, He promises to give you eternal life. The Bible says, to whosoever will, let him come. All you got to do is call unto the Lord, and he'll hear you. Let's take some time and talk to the Lord. And if you're a Christian, if you're a listener today, why don't you determine this year to be content with your life today? Contentment means you're at peace with it. Stop looking to what you lost or what you don't have, and start looking to what God has given you. And he's given himself. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And someday this world will be done away. Our history will be done. And we'll be able to start a fresh new life in heaven with the Lord for eternity, forever and ever and ever. And even be with those that have gone before us. So let's be content with what we have today because there is a better tomorrow. Let's take some time and talk to the Lord.
If you're in here today and you say, Preacher, I want to get saved, or maybe you just did. Maybe you just prayed and said, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me and please save my soul. And if you did that for the first time with me, I'd love to know that. Well, nobody's looking around. If you can say, Preacher, I just prayed that. Would you pray for me? I will. Would you slip your hand up? Preacher, I just got saved, or I want to get saved. Maybe you want some more help. We can have somebody show you personally how you can get saved today. If that's you, just slip your hand up and say, Preacher, I'd like to know more. And Preacher, I did get saved. Just by raising your hand, I'll pray for you. Anybody at all. Let's take some time and talk to the Lord. Let's be content with what God has already given us.